God is doing a new thing and he wants to use us to bring about that new thing of his love, his goodness, his truth into this world. We're so glad you're starting your week with us here on Hope Today. I'm Anna Schmidt and I'm here with Tom Hollis and we're going to be talking about new stuff God is doing with Reformation. I know. I mean, it's a big subject. You know, the, the church has experienced several revivals over the last few decades been fantastic, wonderful things. It's all very good. But what are the lasting effects of those revivals? How can a spiritual outpouring in the church become a cultural awakening in society? And more than that, how can we move from revival to reformation? Well, Dr. Michael Brown, one of our favorites, will be with us to share how we can turn the tide and ignite a cultural awakening in our society. I love it. Yeah. I love it. This is a big... So topic. Big right, subject. it is. We get to talk about how we can change the world instead of letting the world change us. That's right. And also we'll get to discover how you could be used by the Holy Spirit to bring that reformation to our society in the wake of spiritual revival. And you'll see how God can use you bo in both big and small ways to fulfill his great commission. I love that God uses us uh, in just the dailiness of life. Sometimes life can feel so ordinary. We can feel so ordinary, but when we've got the Holy Spirit, spirit in us it empowers us to make our days our interactions extraordinary yeah and i think we'll, we'll ask dr brown about that about how we can in these big moves of god how can we see uh something that is uh that we can do our part in it yeah, yeah that's for right sure. We love good news here on Hope Today, and there is a new survey by the American Bible Society that shows hopeful results about young adults and what they believe about the Bible. We'll have more on that at the end of our show in our Motivational Monday segment. I love this too because it's about Reformation, what young adults, how the Bible is transforming them and they are transforming they culture. Been to that. Well, I want to mention something else, a little, little housekeeping thing here. We have new times coming up for Hope Today. If you see us, uh, are used to seeing us at 9 a.m. and at 1 p.m., those are changing. Beginning next Monday, April 29th, we will be on at 3.30 p.m., 8 p.m., which is our most watched, and also 1 a.m. We'll still have that for you uh, night birds there, but we will have a, a change. So, uh, you know, new things are coming. Things. That's right. And some That's of right. your favorite programs will be on at the 9 a.m. So if you love watching at 9 a.m., yeah. you'll make sure to want to tune in. That's right, for sure. Well, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we can change the world instead of the world changing us. Isn't that, that's comforting. I find that very comforting. Those are the words of our next guest, Dr. Michael Brown, who is the founder and president of Ask Dr. Brown Ministries and the president of Fire School Ministry. He's also a radio show host and author, and in his new book coming out called Turn the Tide, he calls on believers to rise above complacency and embrace the role as catalysts to transform society Dr. Brown, it's great to have you with us again on Hope today. Always good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, let's talk a little bit about these moves of God. You know, we started off with, with talking about that. Tell, maybe you could define these for me, because we all, all, all my life I've heard we want revival, we want revival, and then I'm like, oh, there's something else, reformation. How do, what are those things, and how do we move from one to the other? Yeah, absolutely. Re revival is a season of unusual divine visitation. It's God coming with intensity, power, pouring out his spirit in the church. So it brings about deep repentance, transformation within the church, believers coming back to their first love, backsliders getting right with God. And then from there, because the church has become alive and the Holy Spirit's moving powerfully, it reaches out to the salvation of sinners. So it is a season of unusual divine visitation. You know, in, in, in certain parts of America, especially in the South, we have this, this thing about we're going to hold the revival. We've got a revival scheduled next week. And you can no more hold a revival than you can hold a hurricane. You can no more schedule a revival than you can schedule an earthquake. Revival is not something that, that people work up. Revival is something that God sends down. But when we talk about reformation, we're now talking about the outpouring in the church becoming an awakening in the society. We're talking about something where it's not just the church getting more spiritual and loving Jesus more and winning the lost, but God's people living differently in such a way that it affects the society around us. 
And as sinners get saved, they are so transformed that it literally affects the cultural world. So from outpouring to awakening, from revival to reformation. And, and my last book that just came out, Seize the Moment, talks about when God begins to move, what next? The book that's about to come out that we're, we're going to talk about, Turn the Tide, When God Moves, how can we then take that move of God from the church and bring it into the world around us? What are the spiritual weapons God's given us? How can we bring about change without trying to take over or impose our will on society? And, and how is it that the gospel in the past has been responsible for abolishing slavery and slave trade and bringing about cultural reformation in other settings? What's it going to take to see that happen in America today? Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I experienced some of the Pensacola revival. And so here we are 25 years later, all right? And I know you were involved and we saw the outpourings in Toronto and various places and the various revivals that have gone on. So what are the lasting effects? I think that's always a question, isn't it? We have these wonderful times of drawing close to God. We should always have them, but they don't last forever. I think it was Charles Finney that said it would be great if they just, you know, they lasted forever, but they come and go. I mean, they sort of, you know, there's uh, ups and downs with those things. What are the lasting effects and how can we achieve lasting effects? Yeah, so on the one hand, I'm in regular contact with people who were touched in the Brownsboro Revival. Many of them went to our ministry school. And I can tell you firsthand around the world what they're doing. I, I can tell you about the orphanages they've started. I can tell you about the churches they've planted. I can talk to you about the evangelistic ministries that they lead, some of which are actively touching millions and millions of people. I can tell you about the, the moms and dads who've raised godly kids in their homes after they were touched in the revival. And those kids in turn are now married and raising godly kids. So on the one hand, there are many specific things that I could point to. If we had seen this sweep in the nation on, on even a bigger level, if this had been beyond a local church revival that people came to from around America, and, and it was like the, the Jesus people movement of the 60s and early 70s, when all around the country, so many of us were getting saved, then you have to ask, ask the question, are there lasting results beyond these individual testimonies? And many times we don't look for that. In other words, we're thrilled to see people saved, and that's the highest and most wonderful. We're thrilled to see Christians return to their first love. Terrific. We praise God for that. But then what about the world around us? What about what's happening in our children's schools? What about their indoctrination through a radical leftist social agenda? What about what's happening all the way up into the universities and some of the crazy curricula that's being taught? Where did that come from? A lot of it came from the cultural radicals of the 60s and 70s becoming the professors, the educators, mm -hmm. the, the thought leaders, the business leaders of today. And many Christians sadly were thinking, Jesus is coming any minute, we're out of here. And rather than thinking, what can we do to bring positive change? We were just thinking about escaping and the others said, hey, we have an agenda. The radical feminists, gay activists, and others, they had an agenda to change the world, and they did because many of us didn't have an agenda that would change the world. Well, exactly. You know, you, you talk about in the book uh, about some historical things, and you just mentioned some about Methodism and about ending the slave trade. And, and really, in a lot of ways, Methodism created... Uh, a kind of a modern uh, England, and then e even the, the United States, there wouldn't be a United States probably without the Great Awakening. And, and, and that, that, that part is continually um, bearing fruit. But how do we begin to walk in this area where we go from, uh, wow, this feels great to get close to Jesus, to can we see cultural and lasting transformation? How do we begin to walk in that? Yeah, so what happens when God pours out his spirit, and he is, there are pockets, a little, little bit here, a little bit there. Right before the Asbury revival last year, I got on the radio and I said, listen, I know it. I'm seeing it around America. It's the beginning. There's the beginning of the first wave of the next revival movement is coming to America. And then one week later, about eight days later, Asbury happened. And I got back on the radio. I said, look, something's going on. What has to happen is, as we draw closer to the Lord, we get burdened because of the world around us. We see what's happening with so many young people who have dropped out of church. 
We, we see a radical social agenda that we're dealing with. We see the extraordinary rising tide of anti-Semitism. We see something just like the number one cause of death for Americans 18 to 44 is fentanyl overdoses. We think, what, what in the world is happening here? Something begins to stir in you. And, and th this book, Turn the Tide, that I'm, I'm holding in my hands, it's a manifesto. It's a battle plan. It's, it's a how-to. And, and I even have a chapter about what we can learn from gay, lesbian, trans activists. They said, we have a vision to change society. We have a vision to normalize things that society thinks are wrong. We think it's normal. And they've been so effective on so many fronts without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the Bible, without Jesus in their midst. What can we do with the word of God? Not fighting this primarily in a political way, but a spiritual way that works out in a practical way. What can we do in the school system? How can we have political involvement without political seduction? So I lay it out chapter by chapter, but let it start with a burden. Let it start with a concern saying something is wrong and why I am here. As long as I am in the world, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then he says to us, you are the light of the world. He says to us, you are the salt of the earth. It's easy for us to say, oh, if I had lived in the days of slavery, if I had lived in the days of segregation, I would not have stood with, with the slave traders and the segregationists. And yet many Christians did. Many Christian leaders did. What are we doing about abortion? What are you doing about so many other social evils, human trafficking? You say, well, what can I do? That's the thing. Say, Lord, here I am. I'm just one life. I'm one person. But maybe you have influence in the local school board. Maybe you have influence just over your own kids. Maybe you're shut in, and the only influence you have is with God in prayer. That's the greatest weapon of all. Every one of us can be used by God to bring about positive change. Dr. Brown, this is interesting, the timeliness of this conversation. Just yesterday in church, our, our pastor gave a whole sermon about the state of our country and how we as Christians can bring this reformation into the world. And, and the, the world that I live in is very much the, the home and raising children and having influence uh, with them and also with women and ministry. And so how do we, like I was sitting next to a mom with a little baby and she said, I, I just want to homeschool my, my daughter. Like we just want to have a homestead and have chickens and a cow. And, but is that the way to go or is there a way to stay as that light in the public school system to reform that change? What is your view on that? Yeah, I have three whole chapters in Turn the Tide dealing with us having children, influencing the educational system, getting involved in other ways. So, so it's a real strong focus on, on raising children and then our role beyond that. No, number one, having babies is a good thing. And what's amazing is that conservative Christians in America have more babies per family than atheists or leftists or, or those that oppose our agenda. Pretty, pr pretty strong proportion. However, we don't have that strong a retention rate. We lose a number of our kids as they grow up. We lose them to the faith, so it balances out. So by all means, let's bring the kids into the world. And then we have to determine with each of our kids, are they the type of child that can make it in, in, in a public school system? Maybe they need to be homeschooled through sixth grade, and then middle school they'll be ready. Maybe they need to be homeschooled the entire way, hanging out with other Christian kids, with parents educating them to what's out in the world. Even so, I've had homeschooling parents tell me that they didn't know what their kids were getting on cell phones, that TikTok did a better job of discipling their children than they did as parents. So we need to determine the best environment in which we raise our kids. If they are exclusively homeschooled, let's make sure we educate them and prepare them for what's in the world. But then here's the question. What about some of us getting more involved in the educational system? For, for example, uh, locally in, in the city where I live, we, we were part of, of, of meeting with school board and talking about radical curricula and this is being taught in schools and it's wrong. And we, we had people out in force and numbers, but nothing ever changed because the school board was already slanted 6-3 against our view. What about as a parent getting involved in the school board? 
What about the calling to be an elementary school teacher? What about being a public school librarian? And you get in there as a Christian, you think, I can't believe the book's here. It's this crazy agenda. We, we couldn't even read some of the books publicly, and they're in an elementary school. What about us getting involved in these ways? What about us becoming the salt and the light of the educational system? After all, remember, schools like Harvard and Yale were, were founded as Christian schools. They were, they were founded first to train clergy and then the general public, but in a Christian environment. What about us seeking to make a positive impact? Uh, I, I get into, in, in turn the tide, some surveys of major schools in America. I mean, a, a survey was done by the Harvard Crimson, which is an internal newspaper, they're a student newspaper, and they found that it was roughly 500 to one in terms of faculty that identified as liberal or very liberal versus conservative or very conservative. So how can we infiltrate all of these different areas not to say I'm going to bring a Bible to class and, and in a math class I'm going to preach the Bible, but have a Christian influence as opposed to a worldly influence. By God's grace, we can do it. It's not too late. And we live in a democratic republic where the sky's the limit. Amen. It's not too late. But it is a battle, isn't it? It is a, uh, yes, it is a slog through this. How can You talk in the book about the importance of changing hearts versus just winning battles and elections and things. Can you talk a little bit yeah. about that? Because sometimes, I'll, I'll put myself in this category, we've gotten weary of the, all the, the battling and they're like, hey, I just want to preach the gospel. I just want to love people with, with the love of Jesus. And of course, we need to do that. But what about the importance of changing hearts? Yeah, so if we just seek to change laws through the courts, through elected officials, without also changing hearts, we will have temporary short-term victories that become long-term serious losses. We're seeing it right now. Thankfully, Roe v. Wade overturned two years ago. Massive victory, the result of decades of prayer and hard work. But we've seen now in the election since then that there is a very, very strong pro-abortion push and that this is one of the greatest weapons that's being used. The economy is not strong. The current president is not strong, not very popular in America, yet simply the pro-abortion sentiment, they're gonna take away all our rights with the worst case scenarios. It, it's so strong that it could end up hurting in the polls, and then it doesn't take that long before you end up replacing good justices with bad justices, and, and now the laws get even worse. So along with changing laws, it's important we do that. It's important we stay involved there. We need to actively work to change hearts and lives, to get people to understand what's really happening with abortion, to humanize the baby in the womb. And then for us, instead of just demonizing our opponents and painting them all as the most wicked, horrific people on the planet, and there are, there are some wicked people with a wicked, evil, satanic agenda, and it's overt, and, and they are godless. But there are plenty of others that really think they're doing good that really think that, that abortion is, is a positive value and a woman's right and, and actually saves uh, suffering in this world and does not bring unwanted children into the world. There are many that campaign for, quote, transgender rights or transitioning children, and they genuinely believe this is what's best for the kid, and otherwise the child will be suicidal. And, and, and what we have to do is now, as we love our neighbor, let, let's put a beautiful face on this message of Jesus instead of just a, some, some politician or somebody preaching angrily on a street corner or on TV. Let's put a face of, this is your neighbor, this is your friend, this is your coworker. And have you ever really thought about these things? And as we, through the gospel, lead people to the Lord and then through our influence can change their thinking, can get them past the talking points to actually look at the issues, as we change hearts along with changing laws, we can see massive reformation come to the nation. Dr. Brown, you are so engaged in this, in this kind of, uh, you're on so many different media platforms, kind of in there battling it out, but always with a, uh, a loving attitude. Have you been able to deconstruct? I mean, there's so many like straw men of, uh, uh, this is what Christians are like. Have you seen, have you been able to find ways into people's lives and hearts through the gospel as you've engaged them like this? 
Oh, absolutely. Obviously, in the public setting and the social media settings, you get more of the surface stuff, more of the vitriol, people who don't really know you. Oh, but I've, I've got some beautiful, wonderful stories of, of engagement. As I say, we should have hearts of compassion and backbones of steel. You know, I, and it's just by spending time with people, by taking an interest. When God first laid on my heart 20 years ago to get involved in, in pushing back against gay and lesbian activism and the like, I made appointments with local leaders, local activists, said, let's sit and talk. And I said, tell me your story. And, and I, I made it clear to them, I care about you as a fellow human being. The, the rabbi that did my mother's funeral uh, uh, a few years back, uh, seven, eight years back, turns out he's a pioneer gay rabbi. We're still in touch. We are still in touch. And with his enthusiastic permission, I tell the story of our interaction. It turns out he used to listen to my radio show in New York City. So he knew exactly who I was about Jesus and about social issues. And yet here we stood at my mother's gravesite as fellow human beings. And we said, this is what you're supposed to do. Love your neighbors yourself in the midst of these intense differences in culture wars. And we lay out how in the Turn the Tide book. Amen. Love your neighbor as yourself. Wow, having that spine of steel. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. I really appreciate everything that you're doing and everything you're encouraging us to do. My joy always to be with you. Thank you so much. Well, when we return in 60 seconds, we're going to learn more about how more young people are having their lives transformed by the Word of God. We'll be right back. God is calling you to do something significant in the earth for Him, regardless of your age, skill set, or perceived limitations. What's holding you back? When you give to support Cornerstone Television this month, let us bless you with Rick Renner's life-transforming book, Chosen by God. Every page will help you overcome your limited thinking and follow God's plan for your life. Rest assured, God has a plan, and He will thoroughly prepare you to fulfill it if you'll say yes with all your heart. This book will thrill you with the possibilities that await because you are chosen by God. Request your copy when you give by calling 888-665-4483 or donate online at ctvn.org slash donate. Thank you for helping us spread the gospel through life-changing programming like Rick Renner, Hope Today, Hard Questions, and more. To keep your favorite programs coming and receive Chosen by God, donate today. Good news about young adults. A new survey by the American Bible Society found that more young adults believe the Word of God has transformed their lives. According to the first installment of the State of the Bible USA 2024 report, 58% of respondents either somewhat or strongly agreed that the Bible transformed their lives. One notable finding is that 54% of Gen Z, the youngest group of American adults born after 1997, said the Bible transformed their lives. This is an increase from 50% in 2023. The chief program officer of the American Bible Society, John Plake, said, Our youngest adults show signs of interest in the Bible, curiosity about it, and transformative interaction with it. If this trend continues, we have good reason for hope. Well, thank you to Milton Quintanilla from Crosswalk Headlines. And Tom, I love that. Like, we have reason for hope when we look at the younger generation and how they are digging into the word of God. And I just think I love the connection between Dr. Brown's conversation today mm -hmm. and the survey, the survey that's coming out because what I am wondering is, are young adults hungry for real truth? And when they hear something that actually works in their lives, they find that transformation and they're on fire for Jesus. I think so much that that's the case. Dr. Brown mentioned, about the Jesus movement. You know, they come out of kind of the hippie movement and the radical uh, 60s, and, and there was so much protest and, and clamoring for rights, and, and, and some of it was actually proper. There was a need for proper rights for certain marginalized individuals, but a lot of it was very empty. 
So they come out of that looking for something and all of a sudden Jesus is there. You know, all of a sudden the truth of the Bible is there. And you know, that's something that we have to remember. People are hungry for that truth. There's a, there's a uh, as, as Pascal said, a God-shaped vacuum inside of each of us. And they're looking for that, Anna. They're looking and desiring. They don't know it yet. Right. Uh, and so what you're seeing is uh, these uh, Gen Zs are saying, hey, what we've heard before isn't working for us. You know, the great atheism or the great, they're, they're looking for something that says, what, what really matters? What's, what really is true here that, that makes my life different instead of just a cog in, in a billions of, of year universe that doesn't mean anything? But no, there's a God that does have something for you and is the reason for life. And when they start looking, the Bible's the place they look. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? We are Christ's ambassadors on this earth. We were, we were put here on this earth for such a time as this to be Jesus's representatives in our spheres of influence. So whether you're a business leader, whether you're a stay at home mom, whatever your role, God has put you there for a strategic reason to bring his, his good news into the world. And you know what I love, Tom, is that love and kindness is such a powerful motivator to draw people to Christ. So often I've tried, when I've talked to people about either here in my office, on the phone, on the prayer line, or face to face, try to like deconstruct maybe there a little bit of their, how they feel about the truths of the Bible or about Christianity and say, this is what really matters. When we show love, when we care about that person, you know what, you, you may speak and preach or, or proclaim the gospel and it will not get anywhere, hopefully it does. But if you show compassion to that person, if you show love to that person, you will see a transformation. All of a sudden it's like, hey, this, this, this person's got something real, something I want. And you know, you're not just doing it just to get in, uh, uh, a way into their, uh, into their heart, but it does do that. So ask the Lord, say, Lord, I'm just one person, but I am one, what can I do? What can I do to make a difference? And he'll show you and you'll be part of turning that tide and part of seeing God move in your neighbors. On tomorrow's Hope Today, learn how to combat spiritual warfare and become victorious through Christ. Former U.S. Army Ranger Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman offers biblical guidance and a battle plan to combat the spiritual attacks from the enemy. Don't miss tomorrow's Hope Today. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.